So on September 11, 2001, I was a New York City police officer in the rank of second grade detective. I was assigned to the Technical Assistance Response Unit, which is located out of Bayside, Queens at Fort Totten Army Base under the Throgs Neck Bridge. The Technical Assistance Response Unit is a unit that handles hostage negotiation, surveillance, um, evidence retrieval, and a whole other, a lot of other stuff. So, and I've been there, I was assigned there in February of 98. And I stayed there for 16 years until August 31st, 2014. 16 year career in that unit. So 9-11 that day, I remember, I was in my own personal car and I was on my way to the NYPD radio shop because I was the radio guy. I handled communications basically. And instead of going to the base to pick up, pick up a department car, I just said, you know what? Let me just go direct to the radio shop, which is located off the Long Island Expressway and basically go do what I got to do. So I was on my way in listening to the radio, the police radio. And all of a sudden I hear be advised there is a plane that just went in to the World Trade Center. So I'm driving and I'm like, oh my God, a single engine, two passenger plane must have made a wrong turn or something. You know, it's terrible. People were responding. And then I hear it's a commercial jetliner. And I'm like, wow, that's a real, this is a real disaster. So I get on my phone and I call the base and I go, what do you want me to do? Do I return to Fort Totten or do you want me to go down to the World Trade Center? They said, report direct. Okay. So as I'm driving, I'm about to enter the Queens Midtown Tunnel going into Manhattan when I hear a second plane has hit the building. And I'm like, what is going on? And a very interesting thing, over the radio, the chief of department goes over the radio and says, put the New York City emergency plan into effect. I have no clue what that is. Put the New York City emergency plan into effect. So basically, when he did that, everything stopped. Airlines coming in, airlines going out, subways moving, everything just stopped. The city stopped with this plan. I go through the Queens Midtown Tunnel. There's a lot of traffic. I go down Broadway and I park my car on the corner of Broadway and Day. And I get out and there were other Taru members with me. So we were told to report to the overpass on the corner of West Street and Liberty. If you remember, there were two overpasses, West Street and Liberty and Vesey and Liberty. The Vessi one collapsed on top of that fire truck. Mine, thank God, didn't. So I get out of the car. I'm walking. And everybody's, you know, very upset. And I'm looking on the ground. And there are body parts on the ground, some covered by sheets, some not covered by sheets. And I told the people behind me, I said, face up, eyes forward. Let's go. Just follow me. So we're going, I am on my way to the corner of Liberty and West, the World Financial Center. So on the way there, I'm going through the World Trade Center um, area, and I run into the first deputy fire commissioner, Feehan, Bob Feehan, and Chief Gancy, who was the chief of the fire department at the time. So um, Feehan knows me through our dealings in emergency management, which was my previous command. So Bob looks at me, he goes, come with me and let's go to the fire department op center in the World Trade Center and we'll start doing what we do. And I said to him, I said, I'll tell you what, let me go check in at West Street and Liberty Street and then I will meet you later. My job was to set up satellite communications. The reason for that is if you remember the bombing of February 1993, I went down there and we noticed that when the bomb blew up in the World Trade Center, we lost all cellular communication. So we had to resort to satellites. So now we knew 
whatever was happening at the World, Center, World Trade Center on 9-11, we need a satellite. Fine. I said, Bob Feehan, I'll meet you in about a half hour. Let me go and check in. Good thing I did that. I'll tell you why later. So I go over to the corner and my team is there and my satellite phones are coming down. I look up, everything is on fire on the top floors. And the thing that got me the most is every like couple minutes you would hear. And then those are people jumping and landing. So, and you'd look up and you would see people diving out. One, one couple held hands together and dived out. Now, I'm pretty numb at this point and I will throw a little personal thing in there. During that period of time, I was going through a wicked divorce and I was in a major depression to begin with. So all this did was really take my attention away from what was going on in my life and I had to concentrate. So now we're sitting underneath that overpass and one of the people from the Department of Buildings comes up to me and they said, there's a third plane heading for New York. And I'm like, really? You know, like what else? So the next thing I hear is a roar. And I'm, Shelly, it sounded like a jet engine getting closer and closer. And I'm like, you know, excuse me, my French, holy fuck, I'm about to die here. And basically, it wasn't the plane, it was the first tower coming down. So what we did was everybody like ants spread. It was the most, everybody just took off. You just heard this roar. And all I did was I went across, I went right up to the building and I took my shirt, put it above my face like this, faced the World Financial Center. And all of a sudden, I feel this like wind at my back, blowing like my hair, which I had at the time, <laughs> forward. And I'm like, and everything got black. So my shirt is over my face. Everything was got black. And then I felt this pain in my left elbow. It turned out I was hit with a piece of metal and I got a second degree burn on my arm. All right. So as this is going on, what seemed like minutes seemed like hours. And basically, I, I'm underneath my shirt and I said, God, if you're going to take me, just don't hurt. Don't make it hurt. Just take me. And there were a lot of things going through my mind. You know, I'm in the middle of a divorce. I had two kids at the time. And I'm like, well, maybe this is going to be the end of my pain. You know, so it took a while for that. It was the plume that went down Broadway and went everywhere when that building collapsed. So we're there. I'm against the thing. And then finally, you know, put the shirt down a little. And there were still people there and we needed to get into the building. We just had to get out. All of a sudden, I couldn't believe it. All of a sudden, somebody else, everybody back and some cop pulled his gun and shot out the window that was against the wall of the building that led into the World Financial Center. And you heard, <laughs> shot it out. And ironically, everybody was going through this window to get into the World Financial Center. When I looked down at this thing, the glass was like jagged. And the first thing I thought of was, well, if I trip, I'm going to be chopped in half. And that'll be that. So I go through the window. I lay down on the floor. And I said, I'm going to die here. So I better let somebody know where I am. So I go over the radio, Taru portable to central over detective one. The frequency was detective one. And they said, go ahead, Taru. And I said, this is detective Stuart Goldstein. I am trapped on the corner of Liberty and West. I can't breathe. I'm burned. I think I'm going to die. I just want to let you know where I am. And I just dropped the radio on the floor. 
And my sergeant went over the radio and she said, Stewie, where are you? And I'm going Liberty and West, Liberty and West. And she goes, where on Liberty and West? It's a big corner. And I said, I'm on Liberty and West. I just kept saying Liberty and West. I didn't say I'm in the World Financial Center or anything. So I said, you know, tell my kids I love them. And I dropped the radio and that was that. So I'm sitting there waiting, you know, <laughs> to die. And then all of a sudden, somebody kicks my boot. And I look up in front of me. He goes, come on, pal, time to go. Grabs my hand. Pick, you know, we get up and we walk out the front door. Walk out the front door. Now we are on, the, on Liberty Street between, between West Street and East End Avenue, where the World Financial Center is. Everybody is looking for everybody. Tar any Taru on the air? Any Taru on the air? No one's answering. Everybody thinks everybody's dead, basically. I remember running into my lieutenant in the middle of this. Everything was white. Now, the picture I sent you, did you see that picture I sent you? I thought I sent you a picture on your messenger. I'll email it to you. It's a picture of me covered in dust on the corner. I think you got that. I sent it to you. Covered in dust on the corner. I do believe that was taken by some newspaper photographer. It came up like a couple of days later. So no one's answering. Basically, the first tower went and I run into my lieutenant. And I, I saw Lieutenant, Lieutenant Voza. And I went up, I kissed him right on the cheek. I said, where is everybody? He goes, I don't know. I don't know where anybody is. So we go into this bagel store on the corner of East End Avenue and Liberty Street. And we are taking water and we're dumping it in our faces. So we dump water in our faces and we go out and all of a sudden we hear another rumble. Same like a plane engine again. So everybody goes in the store, <laughs> I'll never forget it, in the store. And we all pile in to this bagel store and we go through a door into the kitchen of the bagel store. And all of a sudden the whole building starts to shake. It gets black again. And I was standing next to my partner, Michael Sartoretti. And we're just waiting for the building to stop shaking and the blackness to go away. So after a little while, we go outside and we go and stand in front of the American Express building, which is on West in Liberty. And I'm going, where is the world? Where is the towers? The towers were gone. It was just melee. And I looked at Lieutenant Vos. I said, we got to get the fuck out of here. And he goes, we can't go north. We just, we, we got to go to the water. So we started walking south and we went to that boating dock behind the American Express building and the financial center. And there were a ton of boats that were lined up to pick us up. And I remember getting on an NYPD harbor boat and they looked at me and from that picture, as you could see, I didn't look so good. And they put oxygen on me and I just laid down and my chest hurt. And I was talking like this because my throat was burned. My throat was burned. My chest hurt. My arm, my arm hurt from that burn. And they took us up to the first precinct on Erickson Place, I believe it's called. And we all sat down there. And slowly but surely, Taru members were beginning to show up. We, that day, we did not lose a Taru member that day, that day. But we lost 23 emergency service cops. I knew all of them. And... The thing is, if we rewind, if you remember when Commissioner Feehan and Gancy said, come with them, if I would have went with them, I would not be talking to you today. I'd be dead. 
So something was on my side that day where I didn't go with them. They died when that building fell. So now I'm in front of the first precinct. And I remember a guy coming up to me, a paramedic coming up to me. And I looked at his patch and it said Harrison. And I used to live in Harrison, New York at that time. And I said, oh, how great. A guy from Harrison saving my life. He goes, hey, dude, I'm from Harrison, New Jersey. And I went, oh, okay. You know, he listened to my lungs. He goes, your lungs sound like shit. We got to get you to the hospital. All right, fine. So an ambulance pulls up. I get in the back of it. There's like six other people in back of it. One guy on the stretcher, everybody they were sitting around. And I'll never forget, there was a guy back there who said, you need an IV. And I think it was some sort of a resident doctor or something. And he was like this. I said, that's okay. Leave me alone. They take me to St. Vincent's Hospital, 7th Avenue. And I remember when they stopped the ambulance and opened the doors, there must have been 25 to 30 stretchers lined up perfectly down 7th Avenue. And at each stretcher, there seemed to be a doctor. And I remember they had like endotracheal tubes that you go when you stop breathing, they intubate you. And I got up, they threw me in a wheelchair and somebody came up and said, he's yellow tag. Um, red is you're dying, yellow, you're emergency, but you're not dying green, you're walking wounded. So there's a little, the funniness of it was the doctor goes strip him because he needs to be decontaminated. Here I am in the middle of 7th Avenue. The press is all lined up. The movie people are all lined up and they start cutting off my clothes. And I remember they got me down. They got me down to my underwear and this nurse grabbed my underwear with a scissor. And I said, if you have any respect for me at all, you will leave my underwear on, please. And the doctor goes, let him go in. Fine. Thank God. All right. So we go in. I go to the floor. They listen to my lungs. They say, your lungs sound like shit. So they put me on an albuterol, albuterol inhaler, which is what you use to dilate bronchioles. And basically, I was there for a few hours. And ironically, a nurse says, I need to call somebody and let them know you're here. Who should I call? So I'm lying there in the stretcher. I'm numb, absolutely numb. Should I call my almost ex-wife or should I call my like 70 year old mother and let her know? And I said, do me a favor, call my mother. Big mistake, big mistake. I'm sorry, Mrs. Goldstein, you can't talk to him. As soon as we get him off the oxygen, we'll see if he can talk. And that was it. I got up, ran over, give me the, give me the, I'm okay. Just calm down, you know, whatever. And, um, Ironically, what was going on in my family is my kids were in elementary school. So the first thing I did was I called the Valhalla High, the Valhalla Elementary School. And I asked to speak to the principal. I said, listen to me, what's going on? We're all on lockdown. If you remember, everything got locked down, even the schools in Westchester. And I said, get a message to my kids, Thomas and Samantha. I said, tell them daddy's all right. I don't know what they know when you're in like the fourth grade and like the ninth grade, but just tell them daddy's all right. And my sister went looking for me, couldn't find me. So she got her husband to call Taru base. And they've said, he's in St. Vincent's. He's alive. That's all. He's alive. So they keep me there for a few hours. They put me in a scrub suit with the doctors wear scrubs. And they said, all right, you know, you, you've got a second degree burn and you know, you can leave now. So I walk outside again, the place is covered with press. And I went back to the command post that was set up on Vesey street near the entrance to that tunnel, to the tunnel. And I went there and they look at me and said, go home. I go, I can't go home. Metro North isn't running. I don't know where my car is. And basically, 
I can't go home. Long story short, I stayed there till four in the morning. And eventually Metro North was running and I, I went home. I went back the next day and, you know, I didn't go sick or anything like that. I, I couldn't, you know. So I went back down and what Taru's job was the second day of this attack was to go on the pile with listening devices, microphones on the end of long poles. So we did that and we were on the pile. And what would happen is you would stick these microphones into the voids and you would take a bullhorn and you would say, if anybody hears me, knock, knock on something. So we did that and then all of a sudden we hear and I went, hold it. I hear something. Now, here's the, was the cool thing about the pile. When we needed quiet on the pile, you would yell out quiet. And then everybody would go quiet. The whole pile would yell quiet. Dead silence on the pile. Dead silence. Nothing. If you hear me knock again, and you would hear, I went, we got somebody down here. If you are alone, knock once. If you are with somebody, knock more than once. And you would hear, she's alone. Or he's alone. It was a she, by the way. But this person is alone. So everybody starts to dig. And then all of a sudden, you hear over the radio, is it 30 Liberty Street? 30 Liberty Street, for some reason, they thought was going to collapse. I don't know why. And all of a sudden, the building was doing something weird. And they said, everybody off the pile. They're yelling, everybody off the pile. And nobody's, you know, we're trying to re rescue somebody here. And they go, everybody off the pile. And all of a sudden, you hear this one long blast of a horn on the fire truck, which meant get out, run. So we dropped everything, ran. I'll never forget. <laughs> I, ran. I ran off the pile. And I was following a DEP dump truck and I ran right behind it and I went right in that dump truck and we went back. Long story short, the building didn't fall. Later on, they rescued somebody, which is one of, uh, I think, one of the last rescues to be made that day. So now they, I go looking for my car, Broadway and Day. I found my car upside down, tires up, upside down. And I went, oh man. So we, I got a bunch of people, we pushed it over and I got it, I got it towed somewhere. And the NYPD was nice enough to fix my car, actually. All right. So um, I worked on the pile for nine months. My job was to videotape recovery of rescue workers. We videotaped the recovery of cops. We videotaped the recovery of some firemen. The one thing that I personally videotaped, there was two EMS people that Quinn and I, his name was Lilo, Lilo or Lila, something like that. And they came up to me. They said, we found Quinn's body. Can you please videotape the recovery? So I went down into the hall and there he was. And the only way you could recognize these people were by badges and name tags. Forget what they look like. So we recovered him. You put him in a Stokes basket, cover him with a flag. Everybody lines up, salutes as he's going up. So I did that for nine months. And the moral of the story was, you know, when I walked out of the hospital, I looked up at the sky and I said, if I can survive a terrorist attack, I can survive divorce. That is what went through my mind. So I went, finally went home. According to my children, I did not speak for six weeks. I just sat in a chair and stared. I remember if you dropped the plate behind me, I thought I was going to drop dead because of the shattering of the glass. Um, this lasted 
this lasted a while, like I would say six months. And I actually had to get therapy for it. And the therapist goes, you were suffering, uh, what's it called? Something, to stra- uh, what's it called? It's called- Post-traumatic a- stress. Right. But she goes, you're still, she goes, you're not suffering post-traumatic so- stress. You're suffering acute traumatic stress. I go, we're months into it. She goes, you're still suffering acute traumatic stress. I mean, God, if you came up behind me, it would, you know. So, um, so, you know, I worked on the pile for nine months. The divorce got final and, you know, and I have, I had guilt, survivor's guilt. Each and every one of these people who died, the emergency service people, I knew each and every one of them. Because if you remember, Taru went and handled hostage negotiation jobs, barricaded perps. The cops at that door were the people who died that day. I knew them all. And again, Feehan and Gancy, if I would have just said, okay, let's go, I would have been dead. And I kind of like have this, like, I had this like survivor guilt. And all the, all the like, um, spiritual people said it wasn't your time. And I'm like, okay, you know, but so again, I worked on the pile and basically a year later I got a pneumonia. And then about a year after that, I got a pneumonia and everything I thought was fine. And basically I go once a year to Mount Sinai for my yearly World Trade Center checkup. Everything was fine. Knock on wood. Just so happens <laughs> a year ago, I'm going for a physical. And the doctor says to me, your calcium in your blood's a little high. I go, so what? I feel fine. She goes, I just want to make sure everything is fine with you. So I go, what would you like me to do? She goes, I'm going to run some more tests. And she runs more tests and she goes, in your blood and in your urine, you have these things called monoclonal proteins. Monoclonal proteins is a sign of multiple myeloma, cancer of the blood, uh, the bone marrow, bone marrow. And I went, but we don't know whether I have it. Correct. You need to go to an oncologist. All right. Now, mind you, this is a year ago. You know, what are we, 18 years, 19 years? Now, I am a critical care paramedic. I know all this stuff. And I go to White Plains Hospital and I see this oncologist and she goes, this could be nothing or this could be something. The only way to really figure it out is a bone marrow aspiration. I went, ugh. I had one of those when I was like 14 years old. And this is getting to me. You hear my voice. This is like getting to me, but it's okay. <clears throat> I, I procrastinate for two weeks. I go, I don't want this. Because you know what? I don't want them telling me I got cancer. I really don't. So I said, what am I going to do? I'm not sleeping at night. I need to know. So I went and got my bone marrow test. All right. So... There are three types of myeloma. One is called NGUS. It's just, it's called NGUS. The other one is called smoldering multiple myeloma. The other one is active myeloma. NGUS and smoldering are not cancer. It's not cancer. Myeloma is cancer. How do you determine it? Plasma cells in your bone marrow, if you have zero to 10, you have NGUS. If you have 10 to 60, you have smoldering. Anything above 60, you got cancer. My bone marrow came back 10 to 15%. So she goes, you have smoldering multiple myeloma. And I went, okay. She goes, now we need to see if it affected your bones. The reason calcium goes up in myeloma is that the plasma cells affect the bones. The bones break, it's called lytic disease. Bones are made out of 
calcium. Bones break, calcium is released into the blood. You get a high calcium reading. Therefore, you got to figure out why and where this calcium is coming from. So I went for x-rays and basically, if you have 10 check boxes to have cancer, I only have one checkbox. It's my plasma cells are 10 to 15%. So I go back every three months to get my blood taken. And they watch my, they watch my kidney function and my red blood cells and everything. The chances of this going to cancer is very, very rare. They said people can smolder for 20 years. So all I can do is hope that nothing else happens. Again, my blood is good. I'm working as a full-time critical care paramedic. You know, I went from cop to medic. It was <laughs> kind of weird that way. And basically, the first thing I did, ironically, I said, I have myeloma. She goes, you have smoldering myeloma. I said, oh, my God. Let me call the Detectives Endowment Association, my union. And they said, oh, you could have cancer. This could turn into cancer. And they're like, I'm like, yeah. I go, I don't want cancer. They go, you got to be prepared. So they referred me to this um, law group that is the Attorneys for the Detectives Endowment Association. And I get a phone call from this guy and he goes, here's the deal. The deal is, is that you need to file a World Trade Center victim's compensation claim. We do all that for you. Okay. He goes, then he tells me like how much like myeloma is worth. And I'm like, well, that's really fine. I really would rather not have cancer than this money. And an ironic part is, and, he, and he's, very, he's very cool with me. He goes, if this kills you, your wife, if you're married, gets one year of your salary. And I go, well, what if I'm not married? He goes, then it's lost. And I'm like, he goes, he's telling me stories how people on their deathbeds get married, sign a contract, and tell this woman they're marrying, make sure the kids get 80%, whatever. So I'm like... I'm like, I'm not going to worry about it. I can't, I can't let my Loma run my life. All right. Um, a story is I once took a guy to the hospital. He was dying. He knew he was dying. And one rule, Shelly, is no one dies in my ambulance. You're either dead before or you're dead after. And he goes, you know, I'm going to die. And I said, yeah, I know. And I said, can you tell me anything? And this guy tells me one of the best things I've ever heard in my life. He goes, people in your situation should not worry about dying. Just live. Just live. And basically, that is the way I live. I work a lot. I, my kids are good. My son is a Fairview fireman you know, and my daughter's a paralegal and I'm civil with my ex-wife, you know, and the joke with my ex-wife was, I said, listen, in about 25 years, I may ask you to marry me, just marry me and don't worry about it. It'll be worth your while, <laughs> but you know, but um, I've survived like the two, the 1993 bombing of the World Trade Center, the nine, the 2001 attack on the World Trade Center. And that's, that's basically my story. It's, uh, you know, people, older people tell about, you know, Japan and, and, and when Pearl Harbor was attacked. And again, we lost more people in one day than we did on Pearl Harbor that day. And I remember the last day EMS was there because EMS would keep ambulances there during the recovery. And I remember he said, uh, this is the final patient count of the World Trade Center. We are closing the command. And he makes a comment like final patient count is like 5,000 something, something, something. This command is closed. So I have not gone to the new World Trade Center. I'm still, I don't know why. 
I'm going to have to do it one day. But that's really, that's the story, Shelley. Let me ask you, did you become a paramedic because of 9-11? No. What happened was I was a EMT, emergency medical technician, in 1980. 1980. I lived in Co-op City in the Bronx. And I went and became a New York City police officer in January of 87. And I would still do EMT volunteer work. And basically, I worked for a private ambulance as an EMT. And I took the police test. And I got hired. And I went in in January of 87. And did my academy. And then the first assignment was the 4 7 precinct in the Bronx, 1987 to 1990. Now, in 1987, I was a GLA cop chasing stolen cars. And I was kind of academically bored. So I went to grad school, New York Medical College, and I got a graduate degree in emergency medical service administration. And, you know, everything was fine. I got my degree. And then one day I found out about this office in the police department called emergency management. Who goes to plane crashes? Who goes to train crashes? Who goes to building collapses? And I said, mm, this seems like something up my alley. So they transferred me down there and I stayed there for eight years. Then I went to Taru and I was a senior hostage negotiation technician. I'm the guy, Shelly, who goes under the house, drills a hole in the floor, sticks a fiber optic camera up through the floor. And I look and I go, oh, there he is. He's sitting on the bed. He's got a gun in his right hand, a knife in his left hand. And I did that for 16 years. Then it, you know, it came time when it's worth more money staying home than it is going to work. So I said, what am I going to do? And I always liked emergency medicine. So on August 31st, 2014, I retired. On September 7th, 2014, I was in anatomy and physiology. <laughs> I was retired for seven days. And here I am, Shelly. I get up in the morning. In the morning, I turn on 104.3. I listen for you. And... Um, I almost texted, it. I almost uh, emailed you this morning going, don't forget about our meeting as you were talking on, on the radio. But this is, you know, it's, my life has changed where I treat bullshit as bullshit. If it's important to you, it's important to me. Easy does it. Don't sweat the small stuff. All right. So it's like 12 steps. It's like a 12 step thing. And basically, um, I knew people who were alcoholics, so I went to Al-Anon. And I went to Al-Anon in 1989. And ironically, you know, Al-Anon teaches you to be spiritual, toss your hands up, blah, 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 blah. And, you know, I, I took that into my life. And basically, the thing that sealed it was 9-11. I walked out of that hospital and I said, that's it. I ain't taking bullshit from no one. If I like you, I'm going to tell you I like you. You want to go out with me? I'll go out with you. If you don't, we're not, and let's carry on. And basically, that, that's really the, the whole story. As the anniversaries kept coming, I would go into depressions. And I can tell you, with time, it gets less, but it came to a point where I could not turn on the TV on 9-11. I could not hear these names being mentioned anymore. I have a whole notebook of my medical tests and my, I'm hoping that this smoldering myeloma does not turn into full blown cancer. And again, there, it's not, it's not a high probability it, it will. My doctor, um, Sarah Sedan from my plant says, you have low risk smoldering multiple myeloma, meaning the chances of it going anywhere are pretty low. But 
you know, I, I talk to people who've been smoldering for 20 years. And the joke is myeloma won't kill me. I'll be hit by a car or something like that. So there you have it, Shelly. You are amazing. Yeah. You are just amazing. And I'm loving the way that you live your life and your perspective. And oh my God, just what a story. Thank you. I'm so honored that you shared that. No, and I've been, I want to tell you that I've been getting up in the morning for you for a while, with you for a while in the mornings. Thank you. And um, it was, it, it was just, uh, I don't know why I'm not dead. I question it every day. And the only thing I can think of spiritually is there's something else for me to do on this earth. I don't know what it is. You're doing it. You're oh, doing, doing it, it every day. You're Not right. only with your work. You're right. But your attitude, the way you are living. I am life. constantly, I am constantly happy. People get sick at my happiness. My patients, my patients, I, I look at them. I go, listen, if you, if I don't panic, you don't panic. And I've had terrible patients. I've had terrible trauma calls, terrible patients, you know, but, and I've delivered five babies, oh. which was cool. But, um, I just, I'm just not a sad person. And if something's bugging me, people recognize it immediately, immediately. So there's no reason to be miserable. I mean, life's too short. Life's too short. I thank you.